Uh, hello and welcome to our final presentation of the day, Carbon Markets for Forest Management, State of the Market, presented by the Climate Trust. Again, my name is Rachel Baker and I'm Washington Conservation Action's Forest Program Director. Uh, as we get started, I'm going to ask you my favorite dorky carbon conference question, which is, what is your favorite tree? Feel free to let us know in the chat if you're so inclined. Um, quick housekeeping. If you'd like to submit any questions to the speakers, uh, please use the Q&A feature, which you can access in the toolbar at the bottom of your webinar screen. Uh, we'll draw from those questions for our facilitated Q&A. You can also use the chat box to send messages, but keep in mind those messages, including your favorite tree, will be visible to all attendees. Uh, so far today, we've heard about small forest landowners and how they think about and manage for carbon and both the opportunities and barriers to entering carbon markets. We'll now do a deep dive into the current state of forest carbon offsets markets. Uh, beyond small forest landowners, a diverse range of landowners implement a variety of carbon offset projects in different markets. It is a complex space. Demand for carbon offsets is expected to grow in the coming years, including in Washington state, due to our new cap and invest program, the Climate Commitment Act. Uh, so the Climate Trust, who we'll hear from shortly, is a nonprofit organization and a leader in funding and managing carbon offset projects. Uh, our colleagues at the Climate Trust will provide a two-part primer on carbon markets. In part one, Julius will uh, describe the current state of carbon markets, including some of the critiques. And then we'll do a 10-minute Q&A period on that content he covers, so submit your questions. And then in part two, Jeremy will dig into two types of carbon offset projects in particular improve forest management and restoration. We'll follow that up with a second 15 minute Q&A session. So this is a big session. We're dividing it into two chunks. Uh, I expect we'll hear a lot of technical terminology in this presentation and throughout the conference. So we've developed a forest and climate glossary to help you navigate any unfamiliar terms, which uh, Brian just dropped in the chat. So please join me in welcoming our next two speakers. Uh, we have Julius Passe, the executive director of the Climate Trust. Julius oversees operations and investments at the Climate Trust to effectively deliver carbon project funding and management to landowner partners with the aim to support their stewardship goals. Prior to joining uh, the Climate Trust, Julius was the forest manager for the Yale Forest and a U.S. Fulbright Scholar investigating climate smart agroforestry techniques in France. Julius is a certified forester and holds a Master of Forestry from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Uh, then we have Jeremy Koslowski, Director of Forest Carbon Partnerships. Jeremy directs the Climate Trust's forest carbon outreach strategy and manages the organization's partnerships with conservation organizations, industry, private landowners, and governmental land managers. Jeremy has over 15 years of forest management experience and understands forest carbon from the landowner's perspective after enrolling a 78,000 acre project in Wisconsin. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Forest Management from the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. So with that, I will turn it over to Julius. Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Thanks for having us. I'm just going to get the presentation up here, so bear with me for a second. It should go pretty quickly, I hope. Can everyone see the presentation? All right. I see Jeremy gave me a thumbs up. Um, yeah, again, thank you very much for, for having us. We're really pleased to be here. Um, we've got uh, a bit of a two-part presentation today. Um, I'll kick it off as, as Rachel mentioned, and then Jeremy will take over and we'll both be available for questions. Um, I do want to start with a very brief overview of the Climate Trust. Um, I know Rachel just, just gave us an introduction, so I don't want to belabor that. Um, do a little bit of Carbon Offset 101, kind of at the high level. Um, I know you had a bit of a Carbon Offset uh, discussion earlier today, um, so that also won't be too in-depth. Um, but I will try to dive in into some depth on the carbon markets. Um, after that, we'll pause for some questions, um, and Jeremy will uh, follow up with uh, a dive into IFM projects and reforestation projects, and then we'll be certain to hold uh, plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, the Climate Trust, we are a Portland, Oregon-based Portland, Oregon nonprofit organization. We do have staff all across the United States, and we work on projects across the U.S., um, 
Ultimately, we're attempting to utilize carbon markets to scale natural climate solutions and as a nonprofit demonstrate new ways to do that. Um, we've been around since 1997. As far as we know, we're the oldest continuously operating carbon market entity in the U.S. We were first established um, back then under the Oregon CO2 standard, which was the first legislation in any of the states to mandate um, that new energy facilities offset their emissions. Um, those facilities were given the op several options, uh, different ways to do that. They decided to put money in a pot, let someone else figure out how to do that. And that's how we were established uh, to take those funds and figure out how to meaningfully deploy them. Um, so that was kind of before the registries really existed in their in their form today. And we helped develop the registries um, and new, way, new, new protocols, new methodologies, and new ways of, of uh, accounting for and, and incentivizing carbon sequestration. Over the years, we've really developed along with those registries and with the carbon markets. Um, now we do still manage some regulatory offset acquisition programs, but we're also an offset project developer, a nonprofit developer, and a um, financer of projects and supplier of credits uh, to different buyers in, in the different markets. We really do focus on nature-based climate solutions, um, particularly improved forest management, reforestation, and grassland conservation. Uh, we work in both the compliance and voluntary markets, um, and we have a large portfolio um, across those different activities um, and have put a lot of money towards um, financing nat nature-based climate solutions and other uh, carbon offset and carbon market solutions. Um, just a quick overview here again, uh, Julius Pesce, I'm the executive director of the Climate Trust. Jeremy Kozlowski is our, Kozlowski is our director of forest carbon partnerships. Um, and our staff um, is, has a lot of foresters on staff. We are a very um, natural resource focused um, staff and, and really try to, work closely with landowners to help them meet their goals. Um, our, you know, given our backgrounds in that, in that arena, um, we really do see these projects in the carbon markets as a way to support good forest management, good land management generally, um, and, and conservation goals. Um, so we'll do a little bit of a, a carbon market 101 to just level set here, uh, especially on some terminology. Uh, Rachel mentioned, um, we might use a few different terms here. Just think it's all the same <laughs> uh, in terms of an offset, a credit, um, emission reductions. You may see um, CCOs, ERTs. Um, one offset or one credit is equal to one metric ton of carbon dioxide, atmospheric equivalent, so it could be methane, right? Um, that is removed from the atmosphere or not emitted into the atmosphere. Um, we can also call that a credit. Um, contractually, people often talk about verified emission reductions um, in the compliance markets. Um, you might see CCO, that's California Compliance Offset, or ARB, an ARBOC, an uh, Air Resources Board Offset Credit. Um, in Washington, Washington Carbon Offset Credit. Um, I know there's a bit of a focus on the compliance market here, um, just to help people understand how things work a little bit. The voluntary registries manage a lot of the project listings and registration for the compliance market. So they may have things that are kind of an intermediate step called a registry offset credit as they go to become those compliance credits. And then the voluntary registries operate their own markets and protocols, and they have different abbreviations and terms for their credits. So emission reduction ton, carbon reserve ton, verified carbon unit. Um, so don't let that confuse you. Just think it's one ton um, or one, one offset, one credit. Um, so let's talk just a little bit about the state of the market here. There's been a lot of growth over the last couple of years um, on a very general level. I think that's because a lot of folks recognize that we can leverage the efficiency of the markets to help us combat climate change and really incentivize uh, nature-based solutions or natural climate solutions. Um, in 2017, a pretty pivotal pa paper came out um, called Natural Climate Solutions, um, and it indicated that we may be able to provide up to a third of the needed mitigation, greenhouse gas mitigation, that we need uh, through 2030 to hit to hit our targets. Um, I encourage people to, to research that paper, look it up, give it a quick read. Um, it's down there cited below there, but uh, Griscom et al. 2017 Natural Climate Solutions. Um, 
in, I think everyone's probably aware back, I think it was maybe 2020, 2021, we saw a pretty big explosion of interest in the carbon markets. Um, a lot of companies were making net zero announcements, carbon reduction goals. And as part of that, they were um, often announcing that offsets may be a part of that strategy. Um, following that, we saw a lot of um, forecasts of very large growth um, of the carbon markets um, you know, into the future. And there was and still continues to be a pretty significant influx of capital that's occurring. Um, we can talk later about, you know, some of the market criticisms and things like that. But um, overall, um, there's still a lot of interest in carbon markets. Um, and I think, you know, we're really in a state of evolution in those carbon markets to respond to some of those um, criticisms or questions about the carbon market, make it a little clearer for folks um, and buyers um, and really provide that um high standard of um high standard uh generally for for the for the markets um so diving in i do want to talk about compliance markets first we'll do a little overview talk about some of the rules the high level rules of the registries um where prices are at and then talk a little bit about the washington context because it's such a new new program um, and then we'll dive into the voluntary carbon markets and again kind of follow the same uh um, formula there so we call these the compliance markets. They're basically the cap and trade or cap and invest. Um, in those markets, the buyers are mandated to reduce their emissions. Um, there really was launched uh, in 2012 in terms of offsets, ones that could use offsets um, in California. The Air Resources Board there manages that program. Um, obviously, it was recently expanded to Washington and the Department of Ecology manages that program. Um, the voluntary, you know, that's different from the voluntary markets where buyers are voluntarily deciding to purchase their offsets and use them. Um, and in either scenario, it's, you know, one tool in the tool chest of, of these companies, um, in, in their approach to reducing emissions and meeting their, uh, carbon reduction goals. Um, I know there's been a lot of folks, um, or are a common, a common uh, misconception out there is that, um, buyers are just trying to offset their way out of the problem. They're not trying to do anything else. Um, and we've we've long said, knowing who some of these buyers are, knowing what they're doing, that that's not necessarily true. Um, and throughout 2023, there was a total of three studies that I know of, two of them are cited here, that came out that said um, offset buyers, when compared to, as a group, when compared to non-buyers of offsets, are making spending more money, making more efforts and making more reductions in-house. So when we're talking about voluntary offset buyers, on average, on the whole, that group is also spending a lot of money and a lot of effort internally to reduce their emissions. So these are groups that are trying to take a you know, holistic approach to reducing their emissions. Buying offsets is one part of that approach. Um, the voluntary markets did start um, before compliance markets, uh, there was very low demand then. And in some ways, they were road testing some protocols that were then adopted by the compliance markets. Um, all of those, or generally speaking, those voluntary markets are run by nonprofit and transparent registries. And we'll get into that in a little more uh, detail later. Um, so the compliance markets, as I mentioned, run by state agencies. Um, they do utilize voluntary registries for initial listing and some initial review. Um, and sometimes that can cause some confusion. Um, so if you were to start a project for either of these markets, you would list it with um, American Carbon Registry or Climate Action Reserve, for example, and your initial submissions would go through them. Um, they're subject, buyers are subject to compliance instrument usage rules. So when I say a compliance instrument, I'm talking allowances and offsets. Um, generally on these cap and trade programs, um, you have a reducing number of allowances each year that are auctioned by the agency. There's also a secondary trading market for them. Um, offsets are allowed, but their use is limited, right? So you can't only buy offsets. Um, you do need to buy allowances or otherwise reduce your emissions. Um, and they're limited to a percentage of the instruments used. In California right now, um, it's 4% and it'll go up to 6% in 2026. It did start at 8%. Um, and half of them that you use as a purchasing entity need to have a direct environmental benefit to California. That does not mean 
um, greenhouse gases. So that means maybe water quality or air pollution or something else. So either in California or you can maybe be on the borders of California. Um, in Washington, offset usage is 5%. Um, you can also use an additional 3% if those offsets are from a tribal entity. Um, that reduces to 4% and 2% in 2026 and beyond. And right now, you can only purchase, a buyer can only purchase offsets in the Washington market that have a direct environmental benefit to Washington. Um, that can change if Washington links its program with California. Um, so entities can buy and sell allowances to each other and offsets can be traded between those markets um, without, um, only if there's linkage. And again, um, that would be, that would then allow 50% and then up to 75% um, that would still be required to be uh, what we call DEBs, direct environmental benefits. Um, one another big uh, difference here is that um, overall in California, um, using offsets increases the total number of instruments, whereas in Washington uh, you swap it, an offset for an allowance, so it doesn't uh, increase the total total limit um, of usage there. Um, there were some important updates in terms of environmental justice um, with the Washington rules versus the California rules. Otherwise, they're very similar programs and the offset protocols are, are identical, basically. Um, one of those is the additional offset usage um, if offsets are coming from tribal entities. Um, and then the Department of Ecology, in consultation with the Environmental Justice Council, can limit offset usage or disallowed entirely for specific entities if they're located in um, overburdened, air pollution overburdened communities and they're contributing, if that entity is contributing um, air pollution there. So um, one of the big criticisms in California about offset usage was this, it's allowing um, facilities in areas that suffer from high air pollution to keep emitting other uh, air pollution, air particulates, et cetera not necessarily related to greenhouse gases. And so um, in the Washington program, I think it goes a long way to, to help address that. Um, talking about offset prices, um, as you can see here, the trend has been going up. And um, as those new usage limits kick in and things like that, um, and discussions about reducing um, the caps, uh, prices have jumped up. Um, historically, offsets have traded at a around 20% discount to allowances, and that's because they can be invalidated. So there's a little bit of extra risk there um, by um, the regulating agency if they find there's a problem with them. Um, and you'll do see that uh, kind of towards the right of that graph, the offset prices, which is um, the orange bar, if anyone's um, colorblind, that's the bottom bar. The top one is allowances. And there's a fl auction floor price in the middle there that steps up. Um, you'll see it does kind of bifurcate beyond 20%. And that's because this graph includes non-DEBS offsets. So DEBS offsets are still trading around a 20% discount to allowances. Um, so that means um, recently we've seen um, California offsets, DEBS trading at around $27 an offset. Um, CCAs are in the mid thirties. Those are your allowances again, non-DEB. So outside of California in the 17 to $18 range, although that does vary uh, within the year and it you know, generally is trending upwards in terms of Washington, there's really very few data points or none publicly. Um, and we're, we're expecting potentially mid $40 range if the 20%, um, discount holds true. Um, WCA's, the allowances are in the mid-50 in mid range. So that is currently what some folks are tentatively thinking here. Um, let's see, some additional context on the Washington program. Keep in mind, Washington forests have had access to the compliance market since, uh, I should say since 2012 not 2023, uh, because 
they could always enroll their forest uh, in a carbon project through the California market. Um, so they always had that option. There are, I believe, three projects um, with the um, Confederated Tribes of the Colville, uh, the Spokane Reservation, and Nisqually Land Trust. Um, as I mentioned, currently Washington offset prices. Um, so, so that's all to say, um, will will the will the Washington market um, incentivize more carbon offset projects on forest land in Washington? Um, because they've always had the option to do that through the California market for a long time, um, and I think they they it will if Washington offset prices are elevated like they are right now, or the projections are, they're they're trading or expected to trade higher than California offsets, um, which is again, higher than most offset prices in the voluntary market. Uh, the way they're calculated is different though. So it's not necessarily like you get the same volume um, between the voluntary and the compliance markets. Um, and voluntary market demand is, is still really high. Um, so um, as a forest owner, you might be considering what route you may want to go to access the carbons. Do you want to try to access the compliance market or voluntary market? Um, that's the, that's some considerations there. Um, the monitoring reporting and verification or MRV requirements in the voluntary market are 40 years in the compliance market, either Washington or California, as I mentioned, basically the same protocol. It's a hundred years since your last credit was issued you, and you can get credits for 25 years. So you may have a 125 year project. Um, so that's obviously um, a little more costly to maintain. So those are considerations we frequently see landowners wrestling with uh, in terms of deciding what way they want to go um, to access carbon markets. Um, again, talking about price um, and projecting price are some other considerations to think about. Um, if linkage does occur, um, it may increase the availability of instruments, which might decrease prices. Um, it may allow, it will allow non-DEBs, so that might also decrease prices for Washington projects. Um, on the other hand, California is contemplating much more aggressive targets and, and having the cap ratchet down quicker, so that might increase demand. Um, generally, we have reducing caps, which is going to generally increase demand. Um, and just keeping in mind that the time to issue your first credits is going to be a two to three year um, time frame. So we'll jump into the um, voluntary carbon markets here. Um, and I would say this is where we've seen by far the biggest growth in the last few years. Again, buyers are voluntary. It's called voluntary carbon markets because the buyers are voluntarily deciding to purchase those offsets and invest in natural climate solutions. Um, it's characterized generally by a number, a handful of NGO registries um, and it's a bit of a fragmented but overlapping system. The registries are nonprofit in structure, uh, generally, which keeps focus on the mission. Transparency is always key with these registries. They all have public comment processes. They announce updates and new methodologies and invite public comment. Um, they're not a black box. Uh, anybody can weigh in um, and, and also peek under the hood. They're science-based. They go through technical development and review processes, um, both when they're initially developed, but also when they're updated. Um, at this point, there's been a number of years of trial and error, and you see the evolution of these methodologies to account for carbon and forest and other activities. Um, you can see that change through time as those updates happen. Um, and I would say we've really seen in the last few years that they're extremely responsive to market criticisms and questions and people pointing out potential areas uh, or potential problems or areas for improvement. Um, and I think it's important to remember it's an evolving market and everyone wants to improve the market and innovate better solutions. Um, for example, American Carbon Registry, which did receive some criticism over the last couple of years, has made some really big improvements or updates to their methodology that um, we see as um, costing a little more to, to develop the projects and verify them, um, but I think makes the additionality and baseline cases much clearer, easier to understand, and I think ultimately will re um, result in, in fewer credits being issued, being more conservative. Um, so a bit more on the markets. 
In the US, there's three main voluntary markets operating. One is Vera, which is by far the largest registry, and they have a big international focus as well. So a lot of the Red Plus projects go through Vera. They can go through other, or international projects can go through the other registries as well. Um, the American Carbon Registry, which right now has the majority of the US forest or IFM carbon projects. Climate Action Reserve, they're doing some work on innovating some like forward-looking credits. And they also developed the initial compliance protocol. So if you were to read Climate Action Reserve's normal IFM protocol, it's very similar to California and Washington. So it was kind of developed there. Um, that's a California-based registry. Um, and then again, or, or just getting back to compliance, um, compliance credits can be sold on the voluntary market. And we've seen that occur. So um, that, that can happen. Now, I will say over the years, we've seen private attempts to, or, or attempts to, to make private registries. Um, they haven't really gained traction. Um, we usually see those as characterized by a lack of transparency and a bit of a conflict of interest um, if you have, because they're also typically trying to be the, the developer too, right? So if you get to set the rules and then develop projects and go get projects and bring them in, there's a bit of a conflict there. So we really, really haven't seen uh, much traction with many of those um, private outfits that are trying to do their own um, rule, rule setting and then development. Um, in terms of demand, this is, a, I was hoping to get something that was a little more up to date. This is the most recent I could find. It's from Ecosystem Marketplace. For folks who want to track the voluntary markets, this is a great um, outfit to, to get updates from. They put out uh, a lot of really, really useful data. So you can see that there's just been a really big, big growth in the, the voluntary market. Um, this is number of traded credits. Now, it's, this trend didn't obviously continue in 2022. I think it, um, you know, flatlined a little bit in terms of uh, basically partly because of some of the additionality concerns that were raised, but also because generally a lot of corporates were trying to figure out how they were going to set their offset set their strategies in terms of offset usage. And they were kind of waiting for some of these other initiatives to make their announcements and recommendations that I'll talk about in a minute that are kind of some attempts to streamline the market. As I mentioned, it's a bit fragmented. Um, and so they wanted to make sure that before they started buying a lot of offsets, um, they were doing it in a way that's aligned with their mission and aligned with best practice, which is um, being worked on right now uh, to help help folks make sure they're doing that. Let's see here. Um, so prices. Now keep in mind as you oh, as you uh, look at this that this is um, international. This is aggregated at the international level. So um, prices are a little bit lower here, and I'll I'll give you a little updates. Um, but you can see on on the whole, you you should notice here that. Um, Forestry and land use are the highest priced credits out there. That's composed to renewable energy, industrial processes, transportation, et cetera. With the exception of agriculture, ag there's a lot fewer agricultural credits out there. Um, and that is because it's the voluntary it's a voluntary market. Prices vary very widely. Um, and the drivers of that are what the project type is. Are there co-benefits to that project? So is that if if a corporate is buying carbon credits from a, a forestry project, is it contributing to a more diverse wildlife habitat? Is it co contributing to um, the maintenance of good water, high, high quality water? Um, those are things that these voluntary buyers care about. Um, what type of credit is it? Is it um, a reduction of an emission or an active removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? Um, the location, how charismatic is the project? Is it similar to the business? There's a whole range of things that um, buyers uh, influence buyers' uh, demand and, and thus prices for credits. Um, and the deals themselves are bilateral mostly. They're bespoke transactions. Um, and I'm sorry, there's a couple extra bullets there. Um, so all that said, um, when you when we're talking about the U.S., um, forestry reductions right now are in the mid mid teens. Removals can be twenty dollars or more, so that's like the forest growing and pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. 
um, whereas reductions is the avoided harvest in that year. Um, so those prices are, are pretty good. They're definitely a big jump up from what they were a few years ago. Um, and that's commensurate with the uh, increased demand. But this, you know, keep in mind that prices do vary quite widely. Um, and it's not as prices and, and demand signals and retirements are not quite as transparent as uh, it, it probably could be. And I think um, everyone's working on on increasing that. Um, so some of the efforts I mentioned before to better align the voluntary carbon market with itself and help ultimately help scale it because it is a bit fragmented at the moment. Um, one of the big initiatives and these and a lot of corporates were waiting for these um, documents and principles to be finished. A lot of them were finished this year or drafts of them put out. Um, one of the big ones is the Integrity Council for Voluntary Carbon Markets or ICVCM. There's a lot of uh, abbreviations here. Um, they put out what they're calling the core carbon principles. And they have some um, basic elements that they say are required um, of, a, of a carbon credit that corporate should should buy. And if, it, and if they don't meet those principles, they, they recommend you shouldn't use them. Um, and they have an assessment framework as part of that to assess programs and credit categories. So they're not going to, they're not going to assess every project, right? They're going to assess um, the, the registry, the pro overall program and categories of credits to the CCP so that they will ultimately put out guidance and say, hey, these ones are ones that passed our core carbon principles. Um, there's also, um, I'm going to skip the one in the middle there. There's the um, VCMI or the Voluntary Carbon Market Integrity Initiative. Um, they're working on the buyer side. So ICVCM working a bit more on the carbon credit supply side, um, the demand side, the buyers, claims code of practice, what you should and shouldn't say, um, and you should feel like you can say um, if you're going to be buying offsets and how to talk about that. Similar to that is the Science-Based Targets Initiative or SBTI. Um, and they're a, a, a source of broader corporate guidance on um, the environment and climate change, uh, but they do have guidance specific to carbon offset usage there too. Um, and generally there is work overall to help um, scale the carbon markets by making um, things a little more interconnected and, and um, easier to use. Um, and that's uh, some of that's headed up by the task force on scaling voluntary carbon markets. Um, there's also um, other initiatives out there and groups out there like AIDA, which is the uh, International Emissions Trading Association that's helping to work on this. Um, every, I think everyone recognizes there is still fragmentation in the market and, and trying to um, streamline it and make it more efficient will be to everyone's benefit. Um, so that there is my overview of the markets. There's probably a lot more I could have touched on, but we wanted to save... 10 minutes. I think I did that well on timing, Rachel. Tell me if I didn't, but um sure did. want to do 10 minutes for time or for questions uh, before we dive into forest carbon specific. So I think now we want to take mostly carbon market questions. Perfect. Thanks so much, Julius, for giving us that carbon market 101 and helping us navigate some of the alphabet soup in that space. We got a couple of questions coming in. Um, keep them coming. I'm going to start off with a bigger picture question, and then we'll dive into some of those specific ones. Um, so we have conference attendees who are landowners, land managers, or stakeholders that are advising land managers about uh, their forest management. What factors would you advise those stakeholders to consider as they navigate the choice between voluntary and a compliance market? What are the primary pros and cons in your view? Yeah, I think the primary... Uh, a primary pro of the voluntary market is a shorter time commitment. So right now, 40 years, which is now aligned with the core carbon principles. Um, so, and Jeremy may touch on this some more, but um, that's a 40 years total of monitoring, reporting, and verification. The compliance, both, both states, the compliance protocols are 100 years of monitoring. Um, there is now buyers in the compliance market are mandated to buy um, instruments or, or manage to reduce emissions. Um, and so looking at how long those programs are extended through, technically California is through 2030 right now. Um, ex expectations are it's going to be continued. Um, um, but thinking about that as well. Um, and then um, looking at those price points. And, and I think 
Um, you know, what we do when we work with forest landowners on a feasibility study, that's what we call it when we try to help figure this out, is put together two different scenarios. So you can compare, you know, what the potential returns as a landowner are from one one project versus one market versus the next um, and be able to make a decision that way. That's helpful. Thanks for that that synthesis. Okay, we're going to dive into some specific questions from the audience. You spoke a lot about Washington and California's compliance markets. Uh, Savannah Reed asks, do you have any updates on Oregon's cap and trade law? Um, I don't have any super recent updates. Um, I know that um, I I think it was 2019. Uh, there was an attempt to pass the cap and trade bill there. Um, if folks remember Timber Unity, I think that's what really spurred some stuff on. Um, and the Republican uh, members of the legislature left the state, so they uh, it couldn't be passed. Um, so Oregon took a little bit of a different tack on on their approaches um, through, through some other legislation. Um, so I'm not sure uh, what the outlook, certainly I don't think in the immediate term, um, anything on cap and trade per se. Um, they had to take a, a little bit of a different uh, tactic to uh, or, or approach to, to meet some of those overall goals. Thank you. Um, we've got a few specific questions about uh, voluntary protocols. The first one's from Paula Swedeen from Conservation Northwest. Can you speak more about the changes that ACR has made to its protocol? Sure. Um, one of the things they did is they changed the actual formula, um, which uh, we kind of road tested a little bit. And it actually kind of builds in, I guess what you call as like a floor of credits or like maxes the credits out in a way. Um, so that was interesting. Um, to see. They also require um, a lot more supporting evidence to support the baseline. Um, so they require you to do a, a mill capacity analysis to make sure the amount you're saying could be harvested in the baseline could actually go to the mills. Um, we used to do that anyways, but now it's required. Um, they um, are also relying, they change the discount rates. So some of, So you have to do a financial a discounted cash flow analysis or net present value analysis to see what the to help you build the baseline, um, and included in that you have to incorporate a discount rate. And different landowner types have different discount rates. Some of the criticisms out there were conservation organizations are not as motivated by money, so they shouldn't necessarily only be looking at an NPV analysis or that financial analysis. So their discount rate um, was reduced significantly. Which what that results in is you may um, want to be in your baseline, you may, um, be a little less aggressive in your harvest because it doesn't matter as much in the financial analysis to harvest later on. And they're also relying on a clause in there about plausibility. Um, so you, as much as we'd all like to have a very easy to understand way to do the accounting, um, and forecasts and things like that, there's a pretty general clause in their plausibility. So you have to really show that what you're proposing, it's actually plausible. Um, and that's a bit of a gray area, which increases costs, um, but that we've seen that be relied upon. Um, and overall, um, we definitely think, yeah, there's going to, there are already, and will be more um, conservative um, issuances, volumes of, volumes of credits being issued by projects. Those sound like significant changes that the discount rate um, change you mentioned is particularly interesting in my view. Um, another question about potential future changes to uh, voluntary protocols. Robert Riedel asks, what changes do you think are needed in the voluntary market? And, and he notes research that shows that a significant portion of VERA credits are not credible. Yeah, so I, I can't speak too much about the VERA credits because a lot of those are the international type of credits and we focus on the US market. Um, so I, I don't wanna wade into territory where I might misspeak, um, but I will say, um, Vera is also updating a lot of their protocols, not just ACR. They have a lot of protocols out there that often overlap. They're trying to streamline them for one. They're also piloting, um, dynamic baselines. So, um, which makes forecasting a lot trickier and definitely adds risk as a forest landowner. Um, but in some ways could be seen as, um, a little more conservative and safe in terms of additionality. Um, where they would, through time, like these other protocols, you set your baseline at the start of the project, and that's kind of set in stone. Um, but the new Vera protocol 
um, that a American Forest Foundation is using in their small landowner program, particularly, um, they'll be monitoring um, similar forests in the region to see if over time, um, how those change in comparison to the project. Um, so uh, that it's a little harder to forecast and predict, um, but that is that is one change that they're they're working on. Thank you. Okay, we've got a question from David Perk. Um, what about changes to IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is Article 6, and what are the implications? Um, yeah, and they're still working on some of that stuff. Um, we had hoped that there'd be like more finalized guidance last year, um, and folks were a little, I know the community was a bit disappointed by not having all of the things laid out, but things take time. Um, generally, the, the issue there for folks, so you understand, is... Um, you know, com uh, countries at the country level are going to be um, reducing emissions. And it's like, who gets to count uh, the emission reduction or the offset in this country, right? So like if um, in the U.S. we did a project where we reduced the uh, uh, one carbon credit here, we got issued a carbon credit here, we sold it to someone, a, a company in Canada, who's counting that against their their the IBCC framework? Who's counting that against their countrywide goals? And um, that flows down like through the registries and how these agreements are going to be put in place because the each country needs some guidance on that. And they and the registries are looking to those countries for guidance on how because the registries are ultimately responsible for making sure there's no double counting when you sell a carbon credit and trade a carbon credit on the registry. So it does have a lot of trickle down effects in the United States. We typically don't run into that problem or we, we run into it less because a lot of the companies buying credits from U.S. projects are also U.S. headquartered or have operations in the U.S. So it's not as much of an issue as if you were trying to develop a credit from Zambia and sell it to a company in the U.S. Makes sense. So there's that coordination across jurisdictions that makes that extra challenging. OK, we have a couple of questions about Washington's Climate Commitment Act. Um, one of them is uh, whether the Washington CCA is aimed more at the compliance market, the voluntary market or both. I can just knock that question out for us. That's a compliance market. Uh, the Climate Commitment Act is, is um, a regulatory framework in which uh, many entities in Washington are required to reduce emissions and offsets are an option of, of one way for um, that greenhouse gas emissions reduction to be accomplished. We have another question about um, Washington. It says, Washington Forest Offset Protocols adopted by the Department of Ecology are more or less copied from the California rules. As a result, they're tailored to California forests and even have the California Forest Practices Act as a regulatory baseline. Many Washington forest landowners have found that a Washington protocol that fails to recognize the uniqueness of Washington forests and regulations is a significant barrier to participation. Do you think that a Washington specific uh, offset protocol would make linkage to California impossible? Uh, and I'll add, because this is an issue that comes up in our work too, um, what do you think are the would be some needed or, or helpful changes to California's protocol to in some way make it more effective in Washington? Right. And and just to clarify that question a little bit, the um what's being referred to is some of the environmental requirements. And so um yes, there's things in there like um clear-cut sizes, um and other items that are that you have that you're not allowed to do, it makes you just ineligible. So there are some items in there um, that could be could be worked on to make it, um, you know, make it maybe easier or or a better fit for Washington forests. Um, in terms of linkage, I think they copied it over like the way just verbatim because there's some language about uh, in the cap and trade legislation in California that says. Like linking with another jurisdiction, you need the the program needs to be as or more stringent than the California one, and I think that's a kind of a can be interpreted very widely. Um, so I, I'm assuming it's a easier fit if you just copied over um, text for text. Uh, but yeah, that that can be a bit of a challenge. Now I will say, um, on a project level, you when you do when you're making your baseline and incorporating legal restrictions in the baseline, and this is in terms of volumes of credits, not eligibility, but it is local reg regulations. So you wouldn't have to apply California laws to how much you could harvest in terms of calculating how many credits you get. 
and they do use FIA data, as Jeremy will get into, um, to look at regional forest um, practice levels and regional forest um, um, carbon stocking to help also constrain that baseline, which is also a local thing. So it is very much focused on that environmental, um, the environmental safeguards are, yes, they are based on the California um, law. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, okay. Question about biochar. Have you seen any projects that have involved py pyrolysis and biochar as a technique to sequester carbon, especially as part of a fuels reduction effort? Um, there's a lot of interest right now in biochar. Um, and yes, a lot of that interest is focused on um, doing fuels reduction in forests and taking that um, that material turning into biochar. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done because there's, there's just a lot of moving parts, both with, there's a lot of sources of material to make biochar could be from ag fields, et cetera. could be from like sewage or something like that. Um, and so making a protocol on one is going to be very difficult or very different from another. And then where's that stuff going? Um, and what is the actual sequestration and storage rates in the soil, if it's being, you know, spread on fields, potentially, um, the soil science in on all the ag protocols and things, we always run into this problem where the soil science, so soil science is very complicated. There's not enough data out there. Um, and so it may be difficult to quantify the sequestration storage rates of adding it to fields, for instance. So a lot of complications in biochar. I think there's potential, but a lot has to get worked out. And there, But there is a lot of interest and money behind it trying to figure that stuff out. Um, and yeah, I think it would be a great solution uh, to help with, with fuels reduction. Um, we'll do one more question and then uh, pivot to Jeremy's presentation and we can have plenty more time for Q&A at the end. Um, so I'm thinking about the two presentations we heard earlier today from landowners, and my mind is still thinking about how carbon offsets um, can help landowners achieve their goals. So I'm curious, based on what you've seen, how do carbon offset payments to landowners generally compare to the costs of implementing and, and monitoring a carbon offset project? Or how does that revenue often compare to a, a baseline scenario without a carbon project? Trying to get a sense of the, the potential benefit that a landowner can uh, see from doing a carbon offset project, though it I'm sure is highly variable. Yeah, it is really variable across the country. Um, and by, you know, what stage of growth your forest is in, like what products are there. Um, you know, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, timber is very valuable. Um, per acre land values are very valuable for forest land versus other parts of the country where trees grow a lot more slowly. There's maybe not as robust of a market. So that all factors into your the second part of your question on how do you you know figure that out? Um, but we you know for there's some instances projects we've done where we've worked with um, in Maine um, forests that have been primarily producing for the chip and saw market and they've stopped their harvest and what they want to do is transition to a saw timber rotation to to ultimately uh, take advantage of higher prices for saw timber and they're going to use carbon to help pay for their carrying costs until they get to that level. So there's a lot of different ways that carbon can interplay with the timber markets. To answer your first, and it does really vary across the country, um, to answer the first part of your question, um, for, you know, when we work with a landowner and do a feasibility study, that feasibility study includes the full monitoring reporting verification costs, whether it's the 40 year time frame for the voluntary market or the 100 125 years for the compliance market. So as a landowner, you should definitely be, you should definitely know about that and, and make sure, you know, if you're not talking with us, but if you're talking with someone else that you're getting the full estimate of costs for that MRV. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's, I guess, essentially just a, either putting some money aside or um, putting some in an endowment to maybe cover those costs in the future, or maybe you would expect you can cover them from timber sales in the future um, because you can harvest timber under a carbon project. Um, but uh, we do we do uh, recommend, and I think most developers would give you that kind of forecast as well. Great. Thank you so much for the answers to all the questions. We'll give you a break for a minute um, and bring Jeremy up to do part two of the presentation. And then again, for the audience, we'll come back for a second round of Q&A. So keep sending those questions in the chat and we'll get them later. 
Okay, over to you, Jeremy. All right, can you see my screen up there? Yeah, and you might want to hit that uh, shit, yeah, down at the bottom right there. Yep, we're getting there. All good. All right, well, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, and we will uh, jump into improved forest management. I know I'm um, sitting through uh, a couple of the earlier presentations, we heard a lot about improved forest management, what that is, what that can be for the smaller landowner. Uh, this is geared a little bit more towards um, larger landowners, um, not necessarily the, the individuals, um, but something that, that we work on um, quite a bit. So um, what, what I'd like to do is really touch on um, what is improved forest management, some of the protocol options, um, what a project development looks like um, from a complexity standpoint to, to some timeframes with that. Um, and then the, the project proponent responsibilities. So the landowners um, responsibilities within the um, IFM world. So I'm also gonna try to stay away from as uh, all the carbon offset lingo. Um, there's still gonna be some, but I, I like to try to um, say it in, in layman's terms uh, the best I can. So I spent 15 plus years uh, managing um, timberland or public forest land. And so um, trying to sometimes listen to all the lingo um, from some of these discussions can be like drinking water from a fire hose. So uh, I, I uh, lean towards um, the other way with that. So um, what is IFM? Um, in broad terms, it's a forest management activity which increases carbon, forest carbon stocks compared to business as usual. Uh, you've heard this um, a couple times today already in varying terms. Um, it's really similar to trying to explain um, sustainability. Everyone has a little bit of a different uh, term with that, but we're all uh, going towards the same goal. So um, that's really what IFM is. Um, one of the big things for a landowner or a forester working on public land, um, we all are looking at uh, diversifying the products of the forest, whether that's timber, recreational use, wildlife habitat, um, watershed protection. Uh, what IFM does is it creates a new forest product now to come out of that, and that's a carbon credit. Um, and so if you look at it through the lens of creating something new, um, a new niche market that you can produce revenue with um, and har harvest that um, from your forest, um, that's really what, what IFM does. Um, so in an active management program, um, how can you increase some of those forest carbon stocks with within your forest? Um, sim couple simple ways or different ways to do that is to increase your riparian management zones, uh, whether that's BMPs, RMZs, whatever acronym uh, you use as a forester landowner. Um, increase those areas, um, maybe from 50 feet or 100 feet. You can double that. Um, do something along those lines to retaining additional trees, additional carbon on the landscape. If you increase or extend rotation lengths of certain species or certain timber types, uh, once again, we've heard about this today already, um, where you can extend rotation lengths, um, maybe don't enter a stand for additional 20 years, allow that growth to maintain and increase on your landscape, uh, retaining that carbon on the forest. Um, once again, that's that's adding to the forest carbon stocks. Um, increase your green tree retention areas. Uh, I know everyone has different requirements um, in the forest management plan or in their state 
Um, but leaving larger green tree islands, um, once again, um, building off the riparian management zones. Um, these are all things that a forester or a landowner can do or, or a logging contractor. Um, and another big thing um, that we can do as foresters um, when we're looking at forest land and we're trying to um, continually increase or maintain revenue levels, um, we may fall, uh, I say we as forestry uh, or forester, but we sometimes um, try to do active management into some marginally productive timber stands uh, because timber is really the only way to generate revenue. And so um, sometimes we can really push the envelope of what is um, marketable, what is um, you know, where we really should be practicing active management. And so with an IFM project, you can decrease um, active management in those marginally uh, productive timber stands or avoid them altogether. Um, and this, once again, allows more forest carbon stocks on your, on your forest um, to stay long-term, um, which, which helps the IFM project. Of course, you can also do a no harvest scenario um, where it's hands off as well. And so I think a lot of times um, people have the misconception or the preconception that if you enter into an IFM project, uh, that means you cannot cut or uh, will not cut, uh, but that's not necessarily true. There, there's certainly projects that are like that, but um, not all. Uh, and active management plays a pretty large role um, in a lot of these projects um, moving forward. Another thing IFM does is it does take a long-term time commitment by the landowner. Julius touched on this multiple times. Um, I'll touch on this again and again as we move through here. Um, forests really don't I mean, forests grow by the decade. Um, as a forester, you're managing on decades and centuries. Uh, IFM projects are no different. Um, it takes a long-term commitment by the landowner um, to really uh, agree to the process um, and abide by it moving forward. And, and that's a benefit. That's, that's a good thing. Once again, nature-based solution. Um, here at the Climate Trust, that's what we're about is nature-based solutions. Um, IFM is a is a huge part of that. Um, within an IFM project, uh, Julius touched on this too, but credits are calculated conservatively. So um, how, how really is that accomplished? And that's by taking conservative growth rates um, of the timber stands. So um, no matter where you are in the nation, if you're looking at growth rates, whether it's the Pacific Northwest or the Midwest or Northeast, uh, we have assumed growth rates. Um, but if you calculate those on a conservative level, the low end of that growth rate, um, same thing with setting your baseline. Those are set very conservatively. Uh, we've touched on that before as well. Um, and some of those have really changed here recently uh, with ACR's changes um, to really um, decrease the amount of credits available from a project, um, but having those be much more, uh, I would say, real, permanent, quantifiable, verifiable credits. Um, and, and that's, once again, a good thing. Third-party audits. Uh, which are called verifications, are done on IFM projects. So uh, as a developer, uh, TCT will develop a project, um, but we don't get to say solely that that project is good um, or that the uh, ACR, for example, says it's good. We still have a third-party audit um, showing that it's good, um, that the inventory is there, um, that the project makes sense. Um, and then once again, carbon credits are calculated between what you do uh, and what you would have done. So the baseline scenario, 
I think Forest Carbon Works showed a pretty good graph with that and had some pretty good explanations there. Um, and I, I'll get into that a little bit more, but that's really where the additionality comes in, where you get the credit, where the credit um, is then available uh, for you to sell and utilize um, moving forward. So in a, in a broad stroke on some protocols uh, that get used. So compliance obviously is the, the cap and trade or the cap and invest um, model uh, versus the voluntary, which Julius alluded to as well. Is it, is, it is what it says it is. It's completely voluntary, both buyers and sellers in that market. Um, all protocols account for leakage. And really what leakage is, is um, if you choose um, to harvest less or not harvest at all, um, the assumption there is harvesting will increase somewhere else. Um, and so that is accounted for within your IFM project. Uh, there's also buffer pool contributions um, for all projects um, that does change based on location and types of timber. Um, and then again, they do all account for the harvested wood products, right? So that's going to be the carbon stored long term in, um, for example, a, a two by four um, or carbon not stored in something like toilet paper um, that does not last uh, very long in most cases. Um, and so those are accounted for um, depending on the protocol it it changes um, but that is something that we get asked a lot about um, on each forest um, how those wood products um, or do those wood products that are harvested um, are they accounted for um, for long-term carbon storage so yes they are it's part of the formula within the protocols um, a a a railroad tie is going to give you additional credit over um, some pulp wood for um, paper making. We're going to jump into some baselines, and we've touched on this uh, today a few different times, Julius as well. Um, I'm mostly going to speak here to ACR. That is the the bigger protocol that we utilize here at TCT. So. It's the one um, kind of most familiar with. Um, but as you're establishing your baseline on a project, uh, Ju Julius alluded to this as well, but the financial additionality, um, running the MPV analysis, so your net present value um, analysis of your forest, um, looking at mill capacity in the area. So uh, how many log markets are there, pulp markets, chip markets, um, and what their capacity is. Sometimes a mom and pop sawmill is operating at 100% capacity already, um, where some larger mills or um, can, can operate at much higher capacity or the ability to um, truck the product there is at a, at a good capacity. Operational feasibility, once again, are, are the contractors available um, to harvest forest? Um, or would they be available? Um, does the manpower exist? Is the infrastructure in place for that um, to allow those products to be removed um, from the forest? And then it's also, once again, constrained by the 20 year baseline floor average. Um, so these uh, factors all come in to set part of the baseline. Um, you then need to look at common practice within the area. Um, and so you review similar forest management uh, within a smaller geographic area, um, similar ownership area. Um, and so you compare to those. Um, and then you also want to look at plausibility. So is it even plausible um, to harvest more or continue to harvest at the levels um, that you are? And then once again, looking at um, the legal additionality. So 
Um, you need to incorporate all laws and encumbrances. So laws or uh, maybe even zoning um, issues in your county or township, um, policies, any sort of easements, conservation easements, deed restrictions. Um, certainly want to make sure that the landowner has the timber rights um, to the property as well. So um, these are um, multifaceted in order to set that baseline. And once again, adds to the conservativeness um, of that baseline um, moving forward. So then if we wanna look at the compliance or the um, cap and invest, cap and trade, um, so CARB, uh, California's or Washington's um, three uh, legs of the stool once again, right? So we have financial additionality and PV analysis. However, this is going to be constrained by a hundred year floor uh, as opposed to the voluntary market looking at um, a 20 year floor. Um, common practice here is a little different uh, when you're looking at this. And I, I do have a map on the next slide, um, but it constrains the floor um, more by FA, FIA data um, and the reg regional averages um, for forest type and site class. So you're going to look at a, um, a large area and you can you you drill that down all the way to site class and that further constrains uh, the floor. And once again, legal additionality. Um, laws, encumbrances, policies, uh, BMPs, what an, anything that may restrict uh, your ability to harvest into the future is built into that baseline. Um, so looking at the common practice, um, here's a map. It's probably hard to see for you, um, but this is the Northwest uh, United States, the super section map is what they call it. Um, so when you're looking at uh, baseline, you're going to, this is step one, um, you're going to find your location, um, say it's here, the Blue Mountains, um, and then you're going to further drill down into that um, to find um, your, all the way down to site index. So here's a baseline um, for IFM and a little bit of comparison uh, between voluntary and compliance. So um, Julius alluded to some people may be colorblind. I'm extremely colorblind. So I studied ahead of time to know what colors these were. <laughs> so uh, your red line here is your project, um, <clears throat> your project line. So this is um, growth of your forest, uh, moving forward, the green line here at the bottom is your average baseline, um, and the blue is the model baseline. So where you get credits on a voluntary project is anything between the blue line and your project up until you hit the average baseline, and then it's the green to the red uh, from there on out. On the compliance, so uh, the CARB or Washington, it's always the long-term average baseline. Okay, so that that doesn't change. So that's gonna be all the way through. Your, your blue line does not matter. Some of the protocol options for IFM um, are listed on here. Um, ACR, I mentioned, is the American Carbon Registry. That's um, one of the ones we work with a lot. Um, I will say with the Climate Trust, um, we will work with and look at um, any of these options for any project. Um, so we, we do not um, just do one or the other. Um, it's any, uh, whatever fits the model. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit uh, later as well, but um, the landowner goals, objectives, um, and our ability to utilize one of these um, that works the best for everyone. So um, just a quick rundown here, ACR, 
um, inventory based, of course, um, greater than 10% canopy cover. Uh, where does that come from? That's the U US, eh, man, forest service definition of a forest is greater than 10% um, canopy cover. And so that's what they use. Um, 40 year program uh, there. So 20 years crediting uh, with 20 year monitoring. Um, you could renew that initial 20 years um, and have 20, 20, 20 for a total of 60. Um, and those are ex post credits. So credits are generated after. Um, and once again, there's your baseline. We kind of just went through all of that um, over the last few minutes. Um, Vera protocol, um, we've had some discussions on that. Um, but once again, inventory based, wide eligibility. Um, they have that remote sense, uh, a dynamic baseline Julie um, talked about earlier as well. Um, once again, ex post um, 40 year commitment uh, with roughly a 20 year um, or more crediting cycle. Your compliance market, so your cap and invest, once again, 100 year agreement from the last year of crediting. So if you decided to um, credit for one year, it would be a 101 year agreement, um, but you can credit for 25 years. Uh, and there, that's where you end up with a 125 year um, process. So inventory based again, uh, once again, based off the forest services um, definition of a forest there, greater than 10% canopy cover, um, and as Julius mentioned as well, uh, that's based off of CAR, the Climate Action Reserve Protocol, initially. Um, and then at the uh, the last one, there is a Climate Action Reserve um, program um, called Climate Forward. That one um, requires over 25% canopy cover, um, and that's ex ante. So that is um, credits before. So that model looks at um, credit, getting all your credits at one time. So um, kind of like a uh, lottery winner, right? If you win a hundred million dollars, you can take the lump sum up front, but they ratchet that way down um, for uh, looking at that. So you get way less than your, your total credits because we would model that or they, uh, CAR, models that all the way back to day one. Um, and that's how, how the uh, landowner gets their crediting. Um, what we're seeing ourselves, so part of the market stuff, um, is a very limited uh, buyer demand so far on that uh, program. So we have not, um, yeah, I'll leave it there. So I will jump to the development process. Um, I'll try not to belabor any point too long on here, but um, takeaways on development process is that it's um, time consuming. It is um, it is re requires precision and accuracy, um, and it has basically these eight functions um, to go through. I'll kind of step through these um, as we go, but you begin with feasibility. Uh, you don't necessarily end with sales, you end with monitoring. Um, some of these overlap each other, um, but to develop uh, a project from start to finish, uh, or I should say from start to issuance of credits and sales, um, even in the voluntary market, it's going to be one to two years, um, depending on um, you know what time of year you start the project. Um, some bottlenecks within the process as well um, that are out of anyone's control. Um, but it, it is a, a time consuming process. Um, but once again, we're, you know, we're talking decades for a program anyway. Um, so we begin that process with a feasibility or feasibility analysis. So we really want to look at um, what's on the landscape currently, what um, any timber recon data or reconnaissance data that you may have, um, appraisal data are really good ways to um, get an initial look. Um, we'll research the regional timber market. So once again, you're looking at uh, that mill data, um, demand for that timber, um, pricing of that timber, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, it's, uh, as Julius mentioned, 
in Washington, Oregon, Pacific Northwest, your timber grows fast, it's valuable. Um, so we're going to look at that. We're going to need to look and understand any sort of constraints on the property. Um, and we're going to have that discussion with the landowner to know what are their goals? What are their priorities um, moving forward? What are their objectives um, to see what fits? And we utilize all that information to then assess all those different protocols we looked at, um, what's going to work moving forward, what's going to fit best for the landowner um, and ourselves, and really help the project along. Um, from there, um, doing some due diligence site visits, meeting with the landowner, um, you know, having that discussion, because that's a really uh, partnership that's going to last for a long time. Um, so building that, um, but then also going in the going in the woods, um, spinning some plots and doing some measurements, making sure that um, what's what we were told was there is there and we uh, do have a project. So um, you really want to do your due diligence ahead of time um, because these projects cost a lot of money to begin and um, last a long time. Uh, from there, enter the contracting phase. So once again, establish that protocol that um, is going to work best. Um, looking at a contract length between um, ourselves and the landowner and any sort of harvesting limits um, or changes or additions uh, moving forward, whether that's a no harvest scenario or as I mentioned before, um, some sort of change in management that's going to allow you um, to sequester more carbon in the forest. Then we go into inventory. And so this is um, where some permanent plots are going to be established across the landscape um, with a, within certain strata of the forest. Um, that all depends on forest type and our forest and data moving in. Um, super precise. Uh, once again, I am a former uh, timber forester. So uh, when I would spin some plots uh, for 20 years, um, looking at timber, sometimes you would last in a plot for two minutes, maybe five. Um, you get a pretty good idea of, you know, logs, basal area, pulp, um, you, you move on. Um, some of these plots, when they're being measured, um, especially for the first time, you know, instead of two minutes, it, it could be two hours. Um, precision and accuracy are extremely important um, in this in this inventory data um, in the carbon world. So um, once again, I just I can't stress that enough. Um, it's very it's very um, yeah precise and accurate. Uh, and then the last thing there, key attributes as requested. So sometimes um, the landowner may have additional data they would want in each plot, or, or maybe we would want additional data as well. Um, what a great time to get some long-term plots established and get some long-term you know, data uh, looking at your own forest, um, looking going further out. Uh, modeling and documentation. So here we go um, with the analyst, the analyst team looking at carbon stock calculations, um, FVS growth. So that's your forest vegetation simulator. Um, that so uh, we model that out as well. Um, NPV, so net present value analysis to determine the baseline. Uh, once again, all those things I mentioned before on the baseline, um, and then establishing that eligibility and the ownership. Um, and discussing with the landowner too, you know, the commitment and and understanding where or how long they plan to own the land um, and going from there. Here's where we jump into third party certification. Um, so once again, they're they're an accredited third party that comes in, checks it all out. Is it good? Is it not good? Um, and then it gets sent to the registry. So uh, in this case, let's say ACR um, for their review. From there, um, carbon credit registration, um, that gets credits get issued. Um, 
And then we move to sales, um, where our sales team works with buyers to market those credits, tell the story of the property we're working with. Um, because buyers tend to like good stories um, that commands a better price. Um, some buyers really want to have uh, local credits um, for sale um, that they can buy. They they like that. Some buyers um, reach out at one, two, three years ahead of time, asking for specific projects and specific areas as well. Um, and that typically helps um, drive up the cost of a, of a credit. And then monitoring, um, long-term monitoring. So staying apprised of any sort of natural disturbance, um, harvest, um, you know, we need to we need to make sure that we report any of those. Um, we're doing a full verification every five years. That means back to the site, um, doing another inventory. Um, and then annual desktop verifications as well. So making sure uh, from a developer standpoint that we didn't over credit or under credit uh, the, the program uh, or that project. Um, is really important. So that comes back to precision, accuracy of your data uh, and of your models. And if you did things right, or hopefully um, staying on the conservative side of things, um, you're you're going to be surprised um, to the positive and not to the negative. So project proponent responsibilities, this is looking at the landowner. Um, once again, time commitment, um, depending on voluntary versus compliance, those are two very different uh, amounts of time. Um, verifications and inventory. So um, those are different depending on voluntary or compliance. So your voluntary verifications are uh, five years, um, compliance is six, and then 10 and 12, similar that way. So you you hear a lot of different time frames and numbers when you're discussing these plans, but once you have a protocol picked, um, it's it's uh, streamlined. It's not like um, you're choosing five or six or ten or twelve. It's that's defined by the protocol. Um, any management plan within your forest. Um, sometimes, if you will be uh, harvesting, um, doing active management into the future, you will be required to have a third party certification um, of your of your forest. We heard. Forest Carbon Works talk about um, FSC, uh, but SFI is also um, a third party and uh, American Tree Farm uh, also has a cert certification program. Um, Want to look at any reversals, whether intentional or unintentional on the forest. Um, and we need to stay in contact with the landowner on that on an annual basis. Um, so you're looking at annual harvest reporting um, and any large natural disturbances that may have um, taken out standing carbon in the forest. So uh, we're looking at uh, insect and disease that may have been a large scale uh, e um, event, wind, uh, flooding, um, any of those things, uh, tornadoes, uh, hurricanes, something that really um, changed the carbon stocks of the landscape. Here, I'll jump into reforestation. Um, and I think I'm doing okay on time. So um, this one, we're gonna just look at uh, reforestation's role, um, challenges in reforestation. And then once again, protocol options, um, looking at specifically reforestation or afforestation. Um, also fits in here. So here's a beautiful graph for you, um, pulled from that same paper Julius had mentioned very early on in his presentation from Griscom. Um, but, but as you can see, like why reforestation, um, the climate mitigation potential of reforestation versus anything else is an order of magnitude larger. Um, here's a cutoff. I mean, look, it's just um, so much more. So um, that alone is why reforestation is important. Um, and it's also just 
people can wrap their mind around trees, right? They can wrap their mind around planting trees and seeing it. Um, it's visually stimulating. It would be a visually stimulating program to enter as well. So it's a good story. Um, and it has amazing potential benefits moving forward. Some of those challenges though of reforestation, um, number one is gonna be upfront cost, uh, up to $1,000 an acre to do um, site prep, planting, um, browse control, um, release work. Those things are extremely variable um, across the nation, um, but are extremely expensive. Um, not to mention some of the, the high upfront costs, but the availability of seedlings um, tends to be a bottleneck across the United States. Uh, contractor availability, uh, those that can do the planting, those that can do the site prep work. Um, it's, a, it's kind of a niche market there. So finding those things and then also making sure that designing that planting is going to be climate adaptable um, into the future, um, depending on the, the area we're in. So are we looking at additional drought, um, higher temperatures, or is it going to be, is it forecast to be more wet there? Um, or, or we're going to have some stronger hurricanes if we're in the south. So those are things that are um, not just uh, monetary, uh, high upfront costs, but there's high upfront um, design and thought process. Um, trees grow slowly um, from, from seedlings. Um, so you have a low return on investment. So it's hard to make your projects, um, pencil, uh, yeah, what it says, pencil out financially with only carbon. Um, because of those costs, because of the slow growth, um, once again, trees, they don't care about you know the month. They're, they're growing for decades, centuries, um, they're in it for the long term. And so uh, us as humans are looking at a, you know, always a smaller and shorter window. We want to return on investment soon. Um, that's tough to do just on carbon. Uh, there's very, very few carbon reforestation products across the U.S. Um, if you're investing in a carbon market, um, you're probably going to be looking at an IFM project um, that has a quicker return a large return. Um, but once again, like I mentioned, reforestation products, reforestation projects really do make a large impact. Um, so if you're looking for bang for your buck, reforestation is there. Um, and buyers, that being said, buyers are increasingly interested um, because you can take the picture of no trees and then you can take a picture of baby trees and you can take a picture of those baby trees growing and becoming trees. Um, it's a good story. It, it show, it's visually stimulating. Um, and that's showing up in some of the pricing that's higher than IFM projects right now. And that is helping uh, your return on investment um, moving forward. Obviously, higher prices for carbon credits helps uh, all projects. Um, here, it really helps. Right now, we're super happy, uh, proud to, to announce and talk about that we're launching 25,000 acres of demonstration pilot projects across the United States for reforestation. So um, we are looking for those uh, where we can make them work, but um, we really wanna show that these are game-changing projects um, for the future. Uh, here are some protocol options. Um, voluntary market, looking at reforestation. So um, you recognize the names, of course. So ACR, um, Vera, um, both of those are are similar. Again, um, American or ACR having um, control plots for the baseline monitoring, um, ongoing MRV, uh, that monitoring, reporting, um, verification. Same with Vera. However, they have remote sense dynamic baseline um, and a little bit different eligibility with canopy cover. Um, so it's 
a little bit wider eligibility um, based. Climate forward, once again, um, similar to, to the IFM project where they are a front loaded payment of carbon credits um, and a few other small differences there. Um, and then once again, TCT's pilot investment program, um, we're looking at post wildfire. Uh, that's a big one, especially up in the West, um, but all other natural disturbances, uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, anywhere that, um, you know, trees were there, uh, nature wiped them off. Uh, and there's limited to no natural regeneration um, or um, no way those are going to be reforested without um, this project. So um, that's, that's something we're finding um, a lot of interest in. So um, afforestation of marginal egg land, once again, um, that's something we look at all over um, and we evaluate all these protocols again for that. So we're looking at um, 25,000 acres over five years. Um, and any of these projects are creating a, a climate smart timber product, uh, which the landowner does retain the value of that timber as well. So that in a nutshell, um, I'm assuming I probably went over time, um, it are my slides. So any specific um, long-term um, projects, not for just today, but feel free to reach out. I'm more than happy to have any discussion, uh, whether it's markets or individual projects um, as well. So thank you. Jeremy, thank you so much. I'm so grateful we have your expertise to walk us through the, the whole project cycle and all the complexity of IFM and reforestation projects. Thank you very much. Um, we've got tons of questions coming in from the audience. Thanks everyone for being so engaged and asking great questions. Uh, let's jump right into some of them. So we got a few questions focused on baselines and additionality. Uh, and I'd like to ask one from Holly Haley, which connects to the panels earlier today. She says, I'm wondering about how additionality and baselines would work for the many small forest landowners in Washington who don't already have plans to commercially harvest or who have forest stewardship plans that include stewardship or sustainable forest management long-term. Um, how can they show additionality and participate in carbon markets? This feels like it's a, a great sort of summary of what we heard earlier uh, in many ways from uh, O'Neill Pine. So what reflections do you two have on that topic? Uh, yeah, I can start it, but I'll have Julius jump in on this one too. Um, you know, for, for most of the projects we're looking at, it's we don't have that availability for those smaller landowners um, just with the protocols we operate in ourselves. So I'm a, I'm a little ignorant to uh, the ability to speak to the actual small landowner. What I would like to see on a personal level is, is more access to the markets um, because there are a large amount of small landowners out there um, doing good work um, that can provide a significant amount of additionality um, in aggregate um, to this process, um, unless Julius might have more to that. I would just add to your specific question about um, like harvesting and, and history of harvesting. If there's the protocols don't, you're, you don't calculate your baseline on past management. It's based on your, uh, that financial analysis common practice, et cetera. So small landowners definitely do harvest timber. Uh, so that could be a constraint though, maybe on the levels that they harvest in the area uh, on, on how aggressive you could model your baseline, right? Like if, if you're in a region of the country where nobody's clear cutting, maybe you can't model a clear cut, but maybe you can, you can model what other folks are doing around, around you. Um, so I wouldn't, uh, don't come away from that thinking that um, baselines are extending past management forward. Uh, it's it's definitely um, starts with that financial analysis, and then that's further constrained by common practice, um, and then you have to incorporate any uh, legal additionality. That's helpful. That's a note I wrote to myself. Legal, common practice, and financial, the three components of baseline setting. Um, we had a few questions about wildfire, and I should note, Julius was writing answers in real time to some of your questions in the Q&A. 
So if your question disappeared, that might be why. Just click the answer tab and you can see his response, though I may follow up on some of those if we have time. Um, on wildfire, we had several questions about, um, I guess, accommodating increasingly severe wildfire within carbon offset projects. Um, Tally noted that, uh, that increased risk of wildfire, uh, I guess wanting to know how does increased risk of, of disasters like unprecedented wildfire resulting from climate change impact carbon stocks and the market? Uh, and a related question from David Perk is, um, given that California's buffer pool has been nearly exhausted by past fires, how does that impact a linkage scenario um, in Washington? Well, I'll tackle, I can tackle the first one uh, for sure, but um, it, with the buffer pool, um, the protocols are updating the amount of credits um, that need to go into the buffer pool based off of uh, increased wildfire in, based off of where in the country you are um, because there's different threats. Um, it might not just be wildfire. Uh, this group, it certainly would be um, number one, but some other areas have seen increased uh, straight line winds or tornado. Um, some areas have seen decreased um, larger events. So the, the buffer pool itself is adjusted around slightly. Um, we have not seen that being um, depleted in at least in the voluntary market. Um, that does, you know, change your credit load on your own project. So you, um, you know, you can, you if you had a wind event or a wildfire, that buffer pool does cover that loss of carbon. Um, but that buffer pool is ultimately in an insurance bank for you uh, moving forward. So I would anticipate, you know, continued adjustments with that as um, the climate does change and we do see additional, you know, catastrophic events ultimately um, across the landscape. But that is planned for uh, within the protocols and um, looked at from a initial feasibility study of, of any project. Yeah, and, and I can jump in a little bit on the um, buffer pool. Um, so, so far, California's buffer pool is not necessarily depleted. Um, there's been some, um, I would say, fake news articles um, that were put out by some groups um, that have been historically very critical of offset um, projects and programs. Um, and they kind of mischaracterize some of the buffer pool. Um, and how that works. So a full approximately 20% of all credits on California's market go into the buffer pool. Um, of that, around 5% is in that fire category. But if a wildfire occurs, the whole buffer pool is there to cover for it. Um, and so there, so I don't think we're at a point where it's necessarily depleted. Um, and California always has the ability to change buffer pool requirements if that was something that they were getting really worried about. Right, they're they're very much interested in ensuring that um, the buffer pool and the insurance mechanism is, is functioning correctly. Um, so, um, and we've seen on the voluntary market changes in this last update with ACR too. They all they adjusted some things as well. So, um, it's not like they're it's a static thing. Um, that stuff can evolve, um, and they're definitely aware of people talking about that every single year. People talk about. Uh, every wildfire season, people talk about California's buffer pool. Um, and yeah, some people certainly do say and think that it is going to be too small in the future. Um, every year, as credits are issued, more and more gets added to the buffer pool. So it is ever growing. Um, and keep in mind that there's a lot of projects in areas that have no fire risk or very low fire risk that are also contributing to the buffer pool. And those credits um, support come in to support um, wildfire and other projects in fire prone areas. So um, it's a it's a it's a mechanism that put in place to work. And if it needs adjustment, um, it can be adjusted. Uh, how it would affect linkage with Washington, I'm not totally sure. I think they I would assume that they would tackle that on the protocol end and increase the buffer pool um, contribution requirements. And I that would I would assume that Washington would do the same thing on their protocol at the same time. Makes sense. So I appreciate that clarification. There is a buffer pool in California. It is not depleted, but there's ongoing conversation about how to best structure a buffer pool given the increasing impacts of climate change. 
Um, we have another question on wildfire in a bit of a different direction. So less about the impacts of wildfire on carbon offset projects. I interpreted it more as opportunities for carbon offset projects to impact uh, wildfire mitigation, risk mitigation work. The question's from Timothy Leadingham. His experience in California shows stand replacing fire is increasing and is a large source of emissions. Would prevention of stand replacement fire through fuel management be an IFM practice that is compensatable or allowable under offset protocols? So right now, um, you that couldn't be a practice necessarily under IFM. I mean, you could do that on an IFM project, but the reduced risk, risk of wildfire in off your project area, off your property would not be incorporated in that project. There is some work and folks are trying to work on some protocols that are, yeah, wildfire reduction, risk reduction protocols where um, that you would get credited on reducing the risk of catastrophic wildfires and the emissions, reducing the risk of giant emissions going into the atmosphere. But of course, in that accounting, you're going to need to account for the um, small, small diameter trees you're harvesting. Um, so I, I do know, I think it was like maybe 15 years ago before I was at the Climate Trust, I know we looked at that um, and tried to explore that for a program in the Southwest, but it didn't quite pencil out. And maybe there was enough research at the time. Um, so I do know that, um, I do know folks are looking at that now, and there's obviously a lot more interest in it right now. Um, and looking at it on a larger regional, you know, uh, other in other regions as well than we had previously looked at it. Um, so I think there's definitely, we may see some protocols coming out to help with that. Um, either way, I think there's interest in crowds that are buying offsets and also supporting that work one way or another um, as well. Great. Um, a couple of questions about extended rotations. In one case, I want to highlight a question that you answered um, in the chat, Julius. Um, Julia asked about the interplay between lumber prices and uh, IFM projects, basically. Is there an impact there? And I thought the answer was really interesting. And I wanted to ask you to talk a little more about uh, extended rotations. Jeremy highlighted uh, increased rotation length as one type of IFM project. And you noted in the chat, Julius, that actually if you extend rotation length, say to 80 years in the Pacific Northwest, uh, that that can result in more timber volume and obviously more carbon sequestration if that's an IFM project. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, there's some, um, especially in the West side forest, there's research out there put out by the Forest Service that was done decades ago. And, and there's been follow on research that shows um, that extending rotations and managing on longer rotations can increase your overall wood volume that you harvest. Um, and that's based on some forestry principles of how fast trees are growing and, and how those growth rates change over time so that you don't want to, you don't want to, essentially, you don't want to harvest them too young um, because they're growing so fast and putting on so much volume that you're missing out on that increase. But again, if you wait too long, um, they may start, the growth starts to slow. So there's a sweet spot in there. It's called the culmination of mean annual increment. And the research on the West side shows it's maybe in the 80 to hundred year range, not necessarily the 40 year range. Um, when you add on um, financial decision-making um, to guiding that overall management, you start to change when that is. Um, so um, there could be more lumber supply um, if there was a transition to longer rotations. That's that's the part of that. That's how that fits into that answer. Um, and, and carbon could help get there. Thanks for talking through that. Extended rotations are something Washington Conservation Action is often advocating for. Um, so that's super helpful. Um, let's pivot to reforestation a little bit. Um, one question uh, is if you all can share more about the Climate Trust pilot project. Sure. Yeah, we're we're um, as Jeremy mentioned, the vast majority of forest carbon projects have been IFM projects um, because they don't cost as much money to do. You get credits a lot sooner, um, and so a lot of the influx of capital into the voluntary markets we've seen has also been looking to do more IFM projects. There are tons of those projects out there, and you could cannot count on one hand or half a hand how many reforestation projects that have issued credits in the U.S. are. Um, and so we really 
think this is an area you know, as a nonprofit we were going to focus on um, piloting investments into these reforestation projects across the country um, to show how carbon and demonstrate how valuing carbon and the climate benefit of reforestation combined with expected timber values can incentivize more reforestation and after natural disturbances and afforestation um, and land use conversion um, across the country. Um, the research out there shows that that's one of the biggest opportunities we have, as Jeremy mentioned, um, to, you know, combat the climate crisis with natural solutions. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're particularly focused on wildfire, post wildfire restoration, um, in the West. Um, and we are, you know, are, are hoping to work with a whole range of landowners, um, and are, are willing to aggregate small landers into uh, larger projects to help get that work done. Um, for us, we would pay for all the upfront costs of um, tree planting and tree establishment and the carbon project, um, if that's a fit, and uh, manage that uh, and ideally generate uh, carbon revenues for, for the landowner. I look forward and to hearing how that evolves. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna add in that allowing the landowner to retain their their own timber as well. Um, so we're just worried about the carbon and growing some climate smart timber, um, but the landowner ultimately retains that ownership. Yeah, and we hope to, you know, as we're as we're starting to roll these out, um, making sure we're, we're sharing um, lessons learned and, and uh, case studies on all of this um, in the different parts of, of the country. Um, I think, um, as folks know, landowner objectives are very different in different regions and and forest types are very different. So everything's going to look, um, the solution, the optimal solutions, I think are going to look a little different uh, everywhere. Um, the question about additionality for reforestation. So uh, how do you ensure additionality if you're doing a reforestation project um, and replanting is required on public or private lands? So for a reforestation project, that wouldn't be um, necessarily a climate smart project or or one that would be additional because it is legally required. But there's a lot of situations, especially with natural disturbance, depending on the state, um, where it's not legally required. And oftentimes we see um, areas that have burned or been blown down by hurricane or this, that, the other kind of languish um, unrestored and um, maybe converting to shrub, shrub land, et cetera. So um, there's a fair amount of places where... Uh, that could could help. It related thinking about um, public lands and reforestation requirements there, thinking about your experience in particular, Jeremy, um, I'd be interested to hear reflections on, on opportunities for carbon offset projects on public lands, on state or county lands in particular. What do you see as the opportunities there? Yeah, ultimately, um, as we know, the, the demands on public ownership are, um, you know, doing more with less. Um, trying to generate revenue and spend less money. Um, and so sometimes even if you're operating within a sustainable harvest regime and um, on that forest land that you should replant it, um, the funding or the personnel isn't there. Um, and through these large scale events that are occurring seemingly more often, um, you're, you're harvesting um, natural disturbed timber um, for less money um, to try to um, recoup some costs there. Um, so you're losing that revenue, you're losing revenue into the future. And so uh, I really see a, a huge area where this can step in and reforest larger swaths in county or state land, um, because not, not all states um, or counties require artificial regeneration if it if it's not natural it it's fine um so there's a lot of areas here that this could really work because it's not capital up front for the landowner um and we really try to take that workload off them as well um, because ultimately we want to have trees in the ground and so what we can do to to accomplish that um helps helps everyone there so i think I think there's a huge opportunity for that program moving forward, uh, especially in the publicly owned um, landscape. Great. Let's finish up with one more question from David Perk, um, noting the connection between offsets and pollution. 
Um, and the the part of the question I want to draw out is um, paying for carbon and co-benefits. He says, are there more altruistic buyers who are willing to pay for carbon and co-benefits? Do you see the potential for the markets move in a direction where there's payment for carbon and other co-benefits like biodiversity or or watershed benefits? See there. Good, good question. We we already we certainly already see buyers paying for that in that they pay a higher, they pay a premium for carbon credits from like a forestry project or a nature-based project. Um, and in talking with them, it's because of those benefits that you're talking about. There are efforts to maybe um better define those benefits to try to help that market, that side of the market develop more. Um, there's certainly a fair amount of organizations right now trying to work on biodiversity credits themselves. Um, but there's not like, like the carbon markets have had, you know, a few decades to really work on these protocols, adjust them and adapt to them and do some of the underlying science. And the biodiversity market, I think, is credit. If you're talking biodiversity credit market, it's all way more nascent. Um, but there's certainly a lot of folks interested in it. And um, ultimately, this the same thing that I th I think drives voluntary buyers to pay for greenhouse gas mitigation, that being public perception, shareholder expectations, um, et cetera. And just, just like, that's how we, that's what we need to do. I think ultimately at some point, um, and it's starting already, I think through the carbon markets that exist um, to value and try to pay for those other co-benefits, um, climate change, building climate change re resilience and um, encouraging adaptation, I think are other things that fall in that bucket too. Um, the carbon markets, yeah, valuing all that stuff on top of the carbon credit is certainly not the perfect solution, but it's definitely happening um, in that premium. Okay. Thank you so much for the two lightning rounds of questions uh, and the great presentations on carbon markets. Uh, I feel better equipped to navigate carbon offset world out there. And I'm sure our attendees do as well. So thank you very much. Um, and a big thank you to all the attendees for joining the conference today. Uh, we hope this first day of the conference builds some context around carbon markets and how they can support climate smart forest management, um, as well as a greater understanding of the small forest landowner experience and in, in balancing multiple management objectives, including carbon. So next week, uh, on Wednesday afternoon, again, we'll explore how forest and carbon science can inform management decisions in forests across the Pacific Northwest, from the 525 foot thousand satellite view down to local management decisions at the county level. Our speakers will represent environmental nonprofits uh, with a large geographic reach, elected officials focused on local community concerns, and citizen scientists helping to improve forests in their own backyard. We'll start again at 1 p.m. Again, that's next Wednesday, November 8th. And we look forward to seeing you right back here. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day.